Good morning. Put your hands together, saints. Let's greet our streaming family. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, whoever you are, wherever you are. I hope you're hungry, and I hope you're thirsty for some fresh bread. Beloved, this week is a special week. Beginning on Thursday, I just felt like I'd, I was shooting for a possum, and up from the ground came a bubbling crude. Texas tea. Amen. Remember when Jed Clamp had chopped the land and, it, and the oil started, that black stuff started coming out of the oil. The spade has been turned, beloved. Genesis 7:11 says that the rain fell 40 days and 40 nights and the fountains of the great deep were broken up. The performances to all of your promises are at hand. Do you remember last week if you were with us? Ezekiel 12, 28, there's going to be no longer a prolonging of the fulfillment of God's word. All the years of barrenness, all the years of your faithfulness are going to turn into a road of fruitfulness. Be encouraged. Can you believe God could do such a thing? Come on, he gave you the promises. Every promise comes in built with its own season of performance. Remember the angel said to Mary, these things will be fulfilled in their season. Every promise God gives you comes pregnant with a moment of performance. And we've been faithful all these years, barren in most areas, longing and hungering and thirsting and asking and seeking and knocking and waiting. And, but do you know when you don't get bitter and you stay better? God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he spoken, and shall he not do? Has he said, and shall he not make it good? So I want you just to, just to, just the spade is turned, the waters are troubled, there's a rustling in the mulberry trees. I could say it a, a thousand ways, but something's up. Something shifted this week. I'm just letting you know in advance. Ezekiel's vision had the water that came up to the ankles and then it subtly went up to the knees and then it went up to the waist and then all of a sudden it was waters to swim in. So I just encourage you just to put your toe out again and, and go out again and throw your net on the other side of the boat. Something has shifted and you just sit on that word and you just watch for it. Amen? Watch for it. Jeremiah 1.12, God says to Jeremiah, uh, what do you see, Jeremiah? And Jeremiah said, I see the awake tree. I see an almond tree. Springtime in winter. Did you know the almond tree was the harbinger of spring? Whenever you saw the almond come up, you knew even though there was still snow on the ground that the harbinger of spring had risen. And God said, what do you see, Jeremiah? He said, I see an almond tree. And in the Hebrew it says, I see the awake tree. Did you know when it's springtime, Song of Solomon says, the winters are past, the rains are over. And the flowers appear, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. Jeremiah saw the almond tree, the harbinger of spring. And it's called the awake tree. And God says, yes, Jeremiah, and I am also awake, watching over my word right now to hasten it, to bring all that have been prepared into a season of suddenness. Can you say yes suddenly? Yes. Just put your, put your welcome mat out for a suddenly. Just, just, just get it out of the basement and shake the dust off and put it out in front of the front door just saying welcome. Come on, Holy Spirit. Come and do whatever you want. Beloved, you've been prepared all of your life for this season. But let me share a few things that I believe are intimate in the Lord's heart today. We are in a new series called The Epoch of Samuel or The Age of Samuel. And we're going to be in here for about 970,000 weeks from a rough count in my mind, right? <laughs> I'm going to prepare all God's Samuels, young and old, men and women, boys and girls, everyone who's going to be used in this last outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And by the way, um, um, I talked to a great preacher recently and he said, Craig, I, we've got our bakery ticket. He said, look at all the saints that have passed. We're it now. And our number's coming up. You know, it's not the, the 20-somethings next. It's who's next. And you look at your little bakery ticket and, and your number's coming up. If they call your number, you're up next. 
And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what condition you're in, sweetheart. When your number comes up, don't be shocked. You may have to push past those tweens and those 20-somethings and those men and women of power and grace just because you're next. Amen. So keep your little bakery ticket out. Remember when you had to pick the ticket and wait? And you just wait and you just wait because someone's going to call that number. Don't throw the ticket away. Don't get depressed. <laughs> then they call your number and you're not there. Number eight, number eight, number eight, number nine. You don't want that at the, <laughs> the DMV because <laughs> you decided to zone out for a minute. Now you got to wait four more hours. All right. I'm preaching everywhere and I'm preaching on everything today. Last week we were talking about Hannah, and we were talking about the fact that Hannah was Samson's mother, and Hannah was the was the the woman whose womb had been closed by the Lord. The devil didn't close Leah's womb; God did. The devil didn't close Rachel's womb. The devil didn't close the Shunammite woman's womb. The devil didn't close any of these womb. God did. Because, you know, sometimes if you give, if you conceive before you should and you gestate before you should and you give birth to something before you should, everything's wrong. You know, everything's beautiful in its season, but everything's ugly out of its season. So God will keep you from conceiving. He will keep your womb barren until the time is right. And Hannah was hungry and thirsty and all she wanted was a child and her heart was pure and we pointed out last week that Hannah represents those that have been hurt in the house I'm going to continue that theme today the Lord has put it heavy on my heart Jesus is very passionate towards all of you who have been hurt by ministries you've been wounded by the church You've been betrayed by a church lady or a church man or somebody that represented God horribly wounded you, violated your confidence and your trust. The Lord is bringing a healing touch because he's not going to allow that to be an excuse that you can hold any longer for staying out of God's house. The, the expiration date is up on being able to nurse the wound of having been hurt in his house. And did you know, all of you who are burnt stones, all of you that have been scorched or scarred by anything to do with the Christian church, I don't care if it's a Westboro Baptist church, I don't care what happened to you, the Lord is bringing healing and deliverance to the wounds you say, well, Craig, I was hurt in the house. Hannah was hurt in the house. Hannah was barren. And her sister wife, Panina, would taunt her. The Bible says every day, Panina's popping out kids. Hannah only wants one. And Panina keeps magnifying her fruitlessness. Ever been around people that magnify your fruitlessness? Oh, yeah, I forgot you don't have a baby, do you? What kind of diapers do you use on your not baby? Oh, <laughs> Sorry to rub that in, Hannah. Panina is the spirit that seeks to wound your soul and utterly destroy you by magnifying the areas you're barren in. And we find out Hannah, this godly, precious woman, her husband adores her, and he gives her a double portion, and she seems to have everything. He says, aren't I as better than ten sons to you, sweetheart? How many of you know more of what you don't need isn't going to heal you? If one diamond won't heal you, 35,000 diamonds won't heal you, beloved. We don't need any more of what does not meet our need. That'll make you more suicidal, more despondent, more despairing to get more of what doesn't heal you. Just that becomes a magnifying glass on every area you're unfruitful in. By the way, Hannah was hurt in the house. She, every year she goes to the tabernacle with Eli, the blind priest who misread her who misunderstood her, boy, uh, being misread is one thing, but when you're misread by a man or woman of God that's supposed to know God, that's a hurt. That magnifies pain. Remember, Eli's old and dumb and blind, and he sees her desperate, and he thinks she's drunk. Quit drinking your wine, woman, and maybe the Holy Ghost will come upon you. There's nothing worse than being misread by a man or woman of God who claims to know the Lord. 
Some of you have been irretrievably wounded in the house by prophetic types, men and women who claim to be prophets, who gave you a prophecy that maybe started out good but went sour midway. Some of you had, I call them a grenade prophecy. Somebody starts, yea, thus saith the Lord thy God, yea, to his holy daughter. And then they pulled the pin in the grenade and they stuck that grenade in and the prophecy got halfway in and went bad. And it was a wound that you have never been able to recover from. Do you know, I've talked to people who got one prophetic word at one time in their life that derailed their entire life and soured them against any possibility of ever hearing God again. Beloved, there's no fight like a church fight. You can get jumped into a gang and think you got a whipping, but when, when God's people go bad, you can be hurt in God's house. The most unsafe place to be right now is in a mother's womb. The second unsafe place to be is usually in a church environment because you can sustain wounds that just seem irreparable. And Hannah, notice, every time she goes to church, that Panina spirit is there magnifying her fruitlessness. God seems not to be hearing her. Eli's misjudging her. And Eli had two boys, Hophni and Phinehas, who were stealing all the meat of the sacrifice and were sleeping with all the women in the tabernacle. It was a corrupt priesthood. <laughs> Hannah can't get a break. <laughs> she goes to the one place that's supposed to be safe and is molested by a blind priest who doesn't really see what's going on. His sons are violating everything that is holy, and he will not stop them. And the scripture says, finally, God dealt with Eli and his wicked sons and 30,000 that had a similar spirit. And it says in one day, Hophni and Phinehas were killed in battle. 30,000 of their compatriots were killed in battle. The Ark of the Covenant was taken, and Eli heard about it, and he fell back and broke his neck. And Phineas' wife, who was giving birth, died giving birth to a boy named Ichbod, which means no glory. Ichbod. No glory left. How'd you like that to be your name? And you didn't like Jerry or Billy or Lily. Ichbod. No glory. And now this boy, God bless him, he did grow up. <laughs> but God said, the first word Samuel ever gave was speaking truth to power. Did you know we need folk that hear the word of the Lord for true? And the first word Samuel ever got, do you know what it was? First word wasn't, uh, yea, saith the Lord, I shall use thee, or yea, saith the Lord, ye shall see birdies fly in the air. The first word he got was, go tell Eli, I've cursed his house. He and his house will die and I will destroy his priestly line and remove him from power. <laughs> Eli says, hey, Samuel, what was that word you got last night? And he went, ah, uh, <laughs> uh, never mind. And then he goes, he goes, as the Lord lives, if you don't tell me everything, I'll do you in. And so little Samuel, the first time, right? He's got to say, ah, Eli, God says he's through with you. He's going to kill your wretched kids. You're going to see him die in one day. And uh, I'm going to remove the priesthood from your house forever. Hallelujah. Isn't that a beautiful word? And Eli said, it is the Lord. Because someone had previously come to him and told him all of these things. Whew. Could we wish for that prophetic accuracy to visit us again? I'm seeing evidence of it. We need to hear, not general, yea, I love thee. Well, I knew that. Yea, God loveth thee too. Thank you so much. Give me a real word that has detail that actually gives me some guidance. It's coming. But when it comes, you may not want to hear everything. <laughs> <laughs> so notice God is going to deal with all the root of those in the house that have harmed the people. God knows how to take care of his own. You don't need to kill anybody. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And boy, does he do it well. God scoured Eli's house. He said, honey, you're going to die. Your boys are going to die in one day. Your daughter-in-law is going to die. Hallelujah. 30,000 are going to drop dead. The ark's going to be taken by the Philistines. It's like, oh, no. Sometimes it's got to get worse to get better. Sometimes you've got to go left to go right. All right. So Hannah heard in the house, right? 
So we're, we're going to stay there today because we're going to talk particularly about the subject of burnt stones, the byproducts of offense. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2, the New Living Translation says, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Listen, I'm seizing one text. Do they actually think that they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and burnt stones at that? I want you to look at the phrase burnt stones, the byproducts of offense. Did you know we all in our lives have burnt stones, people that we have offended, people that we have rejected, people that we have scarred? You've heard me say it before. We've all been victimized. And we've all been victimizers. You can't stay in any one of those camps because it's not true. It's both and, not either or ever. Yes, you've been victimized, but you've also been a victimizer. And the minute you didn't control, have any control over how you were victimized, but every time you choose thereafter to sin and victimize others, you are responsible. So we cannot stay in a victim mentality. You've got to kill the victim before the victim kills you because we are all it, those who have experienced victimization and we have victimized others. And so that neutralizes all the victim mentality. You can't have that in God's kingdom. He won't allow it. Because whenever you want justice for someone who victimized you, God says, you're going to have to take it first because I'm going to show you everyone you victimized in your life. Well, that's different. No, it's not. Beloved, do you want justice or mercy? Well, I want justice for everybody that victimized my group. And I, okay, then you got to take it first for all the people you're victimizing right now. Oops, everybody gets quiet. Mercy. Mercy, Jesus. Lord, I built before thee a mercy button, and my name is on it, and I shall push it and duct tape it down. Yeah, because you want mercy, don't you, you scoundrel, once you realize what a victimizer you are. You have no right. Isn't it funny how you keep forgetting everybody else's sins when you have to get reminded of your own? You can want justice for others, but you got to take it first, and you will never take another step forward if you get justice because you will be with the Lord. Free to never victimize anyone else again. We all have scorched lives. We've all victimized others. They're called burnt stones. You know the Bible, in, in, in the Bible, the church is considered a house. Have you ever seen the byproducts of a house being built? You go to a building site, and what do you see next to the house? You see bits of tile. You see byproducts of the building process, right? Little things that don't fit anywhere. You can't really build them in anywhere, so you see a big pile of refuse. Those are burned stones, the byproduct of building. But the church is also called a family. We are, we are a living body. And did you know you have in all of your relationships, familial relationships and other relationships, you have people around you right now that you have irreconcilable differences with. Could be mama, could be Aunt Lulu, could be grandpa. Could be that sweet Uncle Bob who just reads his Bible all the time and wears his white socks over his pants and hikes those pants up way too high. Everyone's got irreconcilable differences in their family tree. And you just start thinking about it right now and you'll run into it. You just, you, th those are family byproducts, byproducts of family. And you know, the Bible likens the church to an army. And did you know that under every commander, you will have casualties? Beloved, when the fire of God comes upon any man, any woman, any denomination, any movement, that fire, the, even the hotter it gets, the more you will see byproducts of ashes. And you will see burnt stones. Wherever God moves, there's always a byproduct of offense. 
and but you know Jesus is always redeeming. He's in the redeeming business. Jesus wants to take every burnt stone that you've created and he wants to take all the burnt stones that other people have created, and he wants to reclaim them and build them back in the wall. Notice the imagery of Nehemiah. He was the one that built the walls of God and hung the gates of God. And the Lord right now is in the process of redeeming broken people. He is in the job of rebuilding burnt stones back into the wall. Now, your burnt stones probably will never be able to be built back into your wall. I have to build your burnt stones into a new wall, and you're going to have to be responsible for all my burnt stones <laughs> and build them into another wall because my burnt stones, beloved, the greatest, the greatest pain of my life is reflecting back on people that I have hurt as a leader, intentionally, unintentionally, you know, God knows the difference between rebellion and immaturity. People don't. If you back up over your two-year-old daughter's leg in the car, you didn't mean to, you didn't intend to, you'd never do it in a million years, but you know what? Get out of the car and fix the damage. It's done. Whether you like it, whether you intended it, you have wounded someone. I, that's the greatest grief of my life because my whole design is to want to heal, redeem, save, and bless people. And to know that in any way I've been used to harm is a grief beyond measure. But we all have burnt stones in our lives. You say, well... Why? Where do they come from? Well, first of all, five sources of burnt stones, valid sin. Did you know that sometimes, Matthew chapter 18, the Lord Jesus said, you know, sometimes you've just sinned against a brother or a sister. You, 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 you were rude. You were intentionally mean. You committed adultery. You stole. You lied about somebody. A valid sin. I'm not talking about, well, that's your opinion. I'm talking about you violated Scripture. Sometimes our burnt stones are due to a violation of Scripture. And in Matthew 18, the Lord Jesus puts it this way. He goes, look, if you, if you, if you realize your brother has an issue with you, uh, go to them and try to make it right. But he says, if they won't receive you, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist. You go and you ask forgiveness, but you, you stay out of the results because if they refuse to shake your hand and they want to have a clenched fist, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist. Jesus said you gain your brother if they receive you. If they won't, you lose your brother. Jesus is honest about it. It isn't always flowers and fairies and it's gonna, you're going to land in a feather bed. Sometimes it's just you did your part and you reached out and they slap you in the face and they say, you know, I hope you're miserable forever. I'm never going to forgive you. But notice there is valid sin, right? Sometimes stones are literally burnt because you have violated Scripture. And listen to this interesting verse. Burnt stones are inevitable. In Matthew 18, 7, Jesus said, Jesus said, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Sort of fatalistic. Doesn't it sound? Yeah. You know, you're going to have burnt stones. Sorry, you're going to offend people. But don't you be the instrumentality of that offense, Jesus said. See, we're all equally offendable, and we're all equally able to offend. In fact, the scriptures tell us in James 3, 2, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. I'm sorry, that is not the one I wanted. James 3, 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So James says, look, we're offending in lots of ways. But 1 Corinthians 10, 32 says, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. See, Paul says it, 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 burnt stones are being made all the time. People are being offended all the time. But the goal is we don't want to be the instrumentality anymore that is burning stones. We want to grow up. 
We want to not, our goal is not to give offense to the, to the outsiders, people that don't know Jesus within the church. Part of maturing is becoming a balanced human being that just isn't a uh, death star, you know, offending everyone and hugging burn victims 24 hours a day. How you doing, brother? You know, oh my God, I did so many stupid, immature things. I heard an old message of mine where I said something so stupid in the pulpit. I just thought, oh, Craig, if I was back there right then, I would have shot you myself. But isn't it? A <laughs> God can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. Amen. But the, the goal is we have to understand defense is inevitable in a certain way. But God wants to wean us away from being the instrument of offense. So that instead of burning stones, we're building stones back redemptively into God's work. Now, again, your burnt stones are probably hopeless with regard to you. That's why I need to handle them, okay? And I bequeath all my burnt stones gladly to thee. Enjoy. Because Christ is always redeeming. He's always restoring. He's always cleansing. He's always forgiving. All right? Whenever you see Jesus, he's redeeming. He's restoring. He's dismantling evil. And he's remantling. He's rebuilding burnt stones into the wall. Did you know you can burn stones by valid sins? Secondly, mutual misunderstanding. The book of Acts tells the story of Paul and Barnabas. Remember, Barnabas is the guy... Mr. Loveheart, he's the guy that made Paul's ministry. He, he put Saul of Tarsus into the ministry. He called for him. He mentored him. He funded him. Barnabas, without Barnabas, we would not have seen Saul and later Paul. But the Bible says they came to a flagrant disagreement that was so sharp, it was a mutual disagreement. They had a young man named John Mark who was with them on the first missionary journey, and John Mark abandoned them. Halfway through, he got tired and went home to mommy. Nobody told me it was going to be hard. I broke a nail. The mall's closed on Sunday. Eh. He goes to Jerusalem. He leaves. Paul, next, they're going to do their second missionary journey. Barnabas said, well, let's get John Mark, and we'll go back on the road. And Paul said, there will be cellophane, cellophane balls in hell when John Mark goes anywhere with us. No. And it says the contention between Paul and Barnabas was so sharp that they had to divide. Paul took Silas and went one way. Barnabas took John Mark, went another way. Did you know mutual misunderstanding? Not even a violation of Scripture. Not even a moral issue. It can just be a contention you disagree with so violently that you burn a stone. Now, later the Bible shows us that Paul had a little bit of a change of heart as they all grew up and grew old. John Mark became useful, and he got another chance. But you know what? That doesn't always happen. So whether you burnt your stones through valid sin, I mean, committing adultery with someone's wife could get someone ticked somewhere. And, you know, when huge breaches like that happen, it's like you can't come home and go, you know, honey, what's for dinner? Yeah, give me the salt. By the way, I committed adultery two hours ago. And can I have something to drink? Could you? Do we have any milk in the house? No, I believe there is a chasm all of a sudden, or a chasm, whatever you want to call it. When some major breach of sin occurs, it isn't a light thing that you can just glaze over, right? Some little valid <laughs> sins are, are going to take some healing if they ever heal. But mutual misunderstanding is the next category. Sometimes it isn't a moral issue and, you know, we always think it's moral sin that brings a burnt, storm, burnt stone, not always. Third, false expectations. Did you know you can have an unrealistic expectation of someone or something and they don't fulfill the expectation you had? Now your expectation was insane and demon-inspired. I'll just leave it there. All right. Your expectation was completely out of all reality, but it was your expectation. It was my mammoth expectation. Uh, you know, the scripture says about the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was not the Messiah folks were expecting. He didn't come on a white horse. He wasn't a Jewish Alexander the Great. He didn't kick the butt of Rome. He didn't kill Caesar. He didn't reestablish uh, the, the throne of David and do everything everybody wanted politically. And therefore, he, their expectations were dashed and he was rejected. 
First Peter 2, 4 through 8 says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a choice, chosen and precious cornerstone, and who, those who trust in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but those who do not not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Did you know Jesus our Lord was a stumbling block because he did not fulfill the standard expectations that sinful people had established? Has God ever frustrated your expectation? Little, medium, big, and you were mad you were so put out. You're going to be offended. That's it. Your, your, your stones are burnt. I believe my stones just got a burnt. <laughs> and you found out later it was your expectation that was off. You were so wrong. You were right. You, I mean, you were so off. And you get to know the Lord later, and you see if he would have answered your prayers, you would have been dead. If he would have done what you asked, everyone around you would have died later. And if you, you know, you just look back, and hindsight is always 20 20 vision, right? You look in the rearview mirror and you go, Thank you, Jesus, for never answering my prayers, including yesterday. Because our expectations are off. And if your expectations are wrong, you're going to believe wrong things, and then you're going to be really upset when you don't get your way. See, entitled people want their way now. That's sort of an infantile regression. The baby doesn't get the breast. The baby goes, ah, and goes out of his mind. Baby goes out of existence because he didn't get his way. But that's nice when you're a newborn. But when you're 40 and you're that entitled, I believe your expectations are going to be disappointed, sweetheart. Bless your heart. Did you all think you were staying for dinner? <laughs> when your expectations are frustrated, that becomes a, an avenue for stones to be burnt. People get scorched. Now, they'll tell you it was just because you personally sinned against them, but it wasn't valid sin, and it wasn't mutual misunderstanding. It was just you um, thought Jesus was a feather bed and was gonna, he was your rabbit's foot that was going to be your own personal Jesus. Jesus, your buddy. He's going to do everything you want. Just rub that Jesus, your buddy, in your car, and he's going to give you everything all the time. The only problem with that is you can't find that in the Bible. Anywhere. <laughs> Old or New Testament. Well, I'll find it somewhere. Not in Scripture, you won't. <laughs> so I, you, I don't know why you burnt your stones, but dear heart, you know what? Once the stones are burnt, we have to We have to acknowledge it, and we have to say, okay, God, I have hurt someone in the house. I was Eli. I was Hophni. I was Phineas. I misread. I'm the one. I'm Panina. I hosted a Panina spirit that was cursing and haunting Hannah, magnifying her fruitlessness. And you know, when you come to yourself, boy, is that a piercing moment. Remember the prodigal? says he came to himself, the light bulb went on. Has the pinprick ever hit your heart and it was a light bulb you didn't want to go on? And you think of somebody years ago that the Holy Spirit just does a pinprick and goes, ooh, ooh, and you see something you did, which you've minimized your whole life, and all of a sudden God puts a magnifying glass on it. Don't be shocked if that comes up a little bit because God's trying to rebuild burnt stones into the wall. All those who have been hurt in the house, their valid sin, mutual misunderstanding, false expectations, doesn't really matter. Sometimes it's just mutual immaturity. Did you know in Romans chapter 14, Paul had to, he wrote a whole chapter about the immature people in the church. The vegetarians were cursing the meat eaters and the meat eaters were backbiting the vegetarians. 
and the people who kept the Sabbath on Saturday were cursing everybody worshiping on Sunday. Sometimes we're so uh, desperately immature on both ends that we just manufacture burnt stones. We scorch everybody that comes within our sphere. Why don't I have any friends? That old woman asked me once. Gee, I don't know. Why don't I have any friends? <laughs> Gee, it's a mystery to me, honey. It's just a mystery to your history. When you're immature, when you're a baby, when you have to have your own way. And Paul writes the whole 14th chapter, and he says... If you have liberty to have a glass of wine with dinner, don't go to your brother in the 12-step recovery group and go, mmm, this is a great glass of wine. Want to taste it? Mmm. Oh, you don't have liberty in the Lord? Oh, you're bound up. Oh, I see. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, oh, I see. So you can't smoke weed? Oh, oh, you're one of those legalistic Christians? Oh, I Paul was looking at an immature bunch, and they were all wounding one another. It was Burnt Stones Academy. Burnt stones, Christian fellowship. The meat eaters were scorching the vegans. And of course, you know, the vegans were re-scorching. There were burnt stones everywhere. And Paul just, Paul says, look, 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 you're all so immature. Let me just give you one word of advice. What would love do? Those of you that feel liberty to have a glass of wine with dinner, have it by yourself not in the 12-step group, where if they smell that, they're going to have a lapse. Would love do that? Would love say, oh, I guess you can't have the Chateau Le Mans. $6,000 a bottle, you know. It's not like the old Mad Dog 99 you were drinking. Mm. And you don't go into the vegan place with your steak from Wood Ranch and go, smell that fat. Look at that marbling. <gasps> Here, here, here. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Come on. Come on. Have your liberty in Christ. <laughs> you know, I knew a guy that was raised vegan his whole life, and the first day he took a bite of chicken, he felt horribly guilty. Now, it wasn't a moral issue at all. It's just when you're raised a certain way and you go crossways of that blue law for the first time, you're going to feel all kinds of false guilt, false shame, false condemnation. But you don't want to rub. Would love do that? Would you chase the vegans with your marbled fat? It's the choicest bit that God wanted in the old covenant. Oh, let me just put it on your lips. Now, that's insane. But immaturity does that. I remember when I thought I was a mature Christian because I was smoking three packs a day for 10 years. I thought, I have got so much liberty, I'm going to smoke during leadership meetings. Lord, I'm having a case of the vapors right now. That was the dumbest thing. That was not an expression of liberty. That was ignorance on stilts. But did I see it? No. I figured, hey, I'm just like you. If I can be this guy and love Jesus, maybe you can be cool too and kill yourself prematurely and not live for your kids. Oh, anyway, did you ever do crazy things? Don't, don't look at me in that tone of voice. Just think of you a little while back when you were crazy about something you thought was an expression of your liberty. Maybe it was to judge everybody else. Maybe it was to call everybody names and you just wound up scorching so many stones. You've got Burnt Stones Academy that you're the seminarian that leads. <laughs> do, you, do you know the Bible, Proverbs says there, is, there are men and women whose words are as the thrusting of a sword. Do you know any of them? And they're usually on television representing Jesus and God hates you. <laughs> yeah, and every word is a sword <laughs> thrust. And they're, all they do is char, scorch stones all the time. Well, the Lord says in this season, He's going out personally, and he's regathering all of his burnt stones. Honey, wherever you've been hiding, he's going to find you. He's not going to, no man left behind, no woman left behind. He's coming to get you, and he's going to send servants of his to come, and they're going to redemptively take you, value you, and rebuild you back into the part of the wall of his work, and you are going to find your place again. Someone give the Lord praise right there. Give him a hand. Come on, put it together. Stay awake now. Stay awake. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You see, 
when a stone is burnt in the house of the Lord, isn't that contrary to reason? It should be the safest place for anyone to be. Man, woman, boy, girl, whatever your issue, whatever your struggle, you should be able to belong before your belief is perfect and your behavior is perfect because, frankly, I don't know anyone here today whose belief and behavior is absolutely perfect. So if you couldn't belong until your belief and behavior is perfect, I'm speaking to the air. And you can't be there either. Aren't you glad God lets you belong before your behavior is perfect and your belief is perfect? And we grow. We grow. We fall down. We get up. The righteous man falls seven times. He gets up again. Just get up or fall forward. I'm six foot two closer to the goal when I fall forward. Don't fall sideways or backwards. Fall forward. And then get up. Get up. Get up again. God is seeking out his burnt stones to redeem them. No one can have your place in the wall. He's going to build you right in. He, you're not getting a, a, a play B wall. Well, I was burnt out of the A wall, and now I'm getting the B wall. There is no B wall for God. You will wind up exactly in the wall of his work with the bricks above you, beneath you, and beside you that are predestined by God. Take heart, loved one. So now, we must become his instrumental hands and feet in rebuilding burnt stones. That's what you're here to do. But here are just some little tips. One, th here's three tips, three ingredients to rebuilding burnt stones into the proper wall. First, timing is everything. you got to let things cool. Some issues, even, you must deal with them, but when they're so white hot, you leave it alone. Did you know that it's right to redeem a situation, but sometimes it's so white hot that if you touch it right now, you're going to kill you and kill them, and nothing redemptive is going to happen. you got timing is everything when it comes to seeking out burnt stones and picking them up. Because, <laughs> do you know how many times in principle, yes, let's, let's touch that burnt stone and bring it back into the wall, but it's too hot, it's too soon. You'll scald yourself. Like in Raiders of the Lost Ark, when that Nazi grabs that piece and it scalds onto his hand, it was too hot. Let it cool, Nazi. I can work anything into a sermon. Listen, listen, listen to Proverbs 18, 19. A brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. Have you ever offended someone and burned a stone so bad that your brother or sister, it's, it's like assaulting a, a city that's impenetrable? That's because it isn't time yet. Let it cool. Well, they're just always white hot. And I tried to build that stone back in, but I just could just wait. Timing is everything. The Holy Ghost is just going to put it on your heart, some burnt stone that he leads you to. And, and, and by the way, it'll be someone else's burnt stone. Yours, God will use someone else to build in the wall because they can't stand you still. But with all Christian facade, bless your heart. Oh, we're praying for you. Mm-hmm. So is that why you have a doll of me with needles in the eye? Oh, that little old thing. I don't know where that is. Is that over here? <laughs> you will be used to build other burnt stones into the wall, but you got to do it. Timing is everything. Second, use caution when you're building someone else's burnt stone into your wall. Why? Because Proverbs 18, 17 says, the first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. Be careful when you're rebuilding Joaquin's burnt stone into the wall because that stone's going to tell you every nasty bit of business about Joaquin. Now, let me tell you about the man that burned me, and you didn't need to know. You know, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so in one way we need to listen more than we talk, but you have to be very careful when you're, you're building someone else's burnt stone into the wall because they're going to want to fill your ear. That stone wants to tell you every nasty thing about Joaquin to burn you in the process and make you into a Joaquin burnt stone. 
Well, I was going to build you back in the wall, but that pain in the neck, where is he? And you, then you get on the gossip line, and now we have 10 more burnt stones, and Joaquin's sleeping peacefully at home. He's blissfully unaware that one of his burnt stones was always rebuilt, almost rebuilt, until it defiled you. Don't get defiled by someone else's burnt stone when you're rebuilding it into your wall. Come on, use wisdom. Come on now. Whenever a counselor sees someone for the first time, it's called the presenting problem. It's never the issue, but it's the presenting problem. So you've got to be careful when God uses you to rebuild a stone. Don't listen to all the negative stuff. You know, you can say, look, we're actually in a silent Catholic retreat, and you're not allowed to speak while I rebuild you into the wall. Amen. Why don't we pray for Joaquin and pray that his devils all come out? Yes, we'll, we'll do that. Yes. And pray that the, the principalities do leave him alone. Okay, we'll pray for the principalities too. The ones that animate him. And Okay, we'll do that too. You got, beloved, use wisdom. There's three sides to every story. Yours, mine, and the truth. All right. So don't get defiled while you're trying to be redemptive. And, and all the people said amen. Say amen or owe me it so anyhow. Amen. All right. And the third Remember where you came from. Could you stay humble, please, while you're being used to rebuild someone else's burnt stone into the wall? Because you are a victimizer as well. You have victimized as many people. Well, I really haven't. Well, maybe not quantity, but quality. You've alienated the most important people in the universe. They're your scorched stones. I mean, maybe Joaquin scorched a quantity. But the quality of who you destroy, <laughs> see, stay humble. Remember where you came from. John Bunyan said, he that is face down has no fear of falling. Keep your head down. Don't kneel. That's the execution position. It's not time to kneel. You'll get your head cut off or a mob hit in the back of the head. You need to be face down on the ground, Bunyan said, and you have no fear of falling. I'm going to kneel before the Lord. No, you're going to lose your head. Jimmy Bag of Donuts is going to come up and say, could you kneel down there and pick up my cannoli? <laughs> no kneeling. Face down. That's what this season is for. So remember where you've come from, and remember that everything you put in the toilet stinks too. Don't exalt yourself. Because the Lord has lifted me up now to be the one who restores burnt stones. <laughs> there goes your head. Stay humble. This is a time to remember where you've come from. This is a time not to exalt yourself, but to humble yourself while you're in the sacred surgery room of rebuilding other people's burnt stones into the wall. But the good news is God's got people that are going to build yours in. Isn't he wonderful? Because for those that have been hurt in the house, the statute of limitations is up. He's not accepting that excuse anymore. So you're going to have to go back to church. You're going to have to go darken the door of where you swore before God made a blood oath. You will never be in the church ever. Well, that demon will come out in Jesus' name and tear you a little bit if it needs to. No more excuses. God doesn't accept them. So everything that you've worn as a victim cloak about being a burnt stone, he's not accepting that cash anymore. It has no value. He's just going to remind you what a victimizer you are every time you take a victim posture. And he's going to remind you of all your burnt stones every time you're passing justice on other people's burnt stones. That man burns stones every time he touches them. Okay, God says, now we're going to show the 10 you scorched by saying that right now all day on your gossip phone, I mean your prayer meeting. We have a prayer request for the coven, I mean the prayer, prayer group. Oh my. You ever been to a prayer coven? Oh, they're screaming and yelling, usually quoting a lot of Isaiah. <laughs> Beloved Hannah was hurt in the house, but isn't God wonderful? Within a hundred years, he had taken care of Eli's line and all the people that were the violators and all the people that burned all the stones, they were amply dealt with. And that is not your job to bring vengeance. I'm set as a hitman. I'm John Wick to all the burn stone people. No, you're not. That's a self-assignment God won't bless. 
vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So if you are dealing with burnt stones, it's going to be with wisdom and it's going to be other people's burnt stones that you don't have any investment in and that God can use you to graciously put back in the wall. So God's rebuilding his house. Isn't that good news? He's going to bring us all back together. There's just something, you know, you can pray at home and fast at home, read the Bible at home and watch sermons at home, but you can't koinonia at home. You can't face FaceTime. Mm-mm. Koinonia is in person what, what I have with everybody in this room right now. This is where the juice is. This is where the Holy Ghost falls and deliverance happens. And this is our goal is that we can be together as God's living stones And you know, but I do see a few char marks on all of my stones here today. Mm. But you know, he's fully cleaning and cleansing all those who have been hurt in the house. Now, I'm going to spend as much time on Hannah. We haven't even gotten to Samuel yet. Poor thing's still in the womb. Because Hannah is the archetypical image of the barren woman who has not gotten bitter but is better and she's going to get pregnant at just the right time and did you know the bible says that eli after misreading her finally did get the holy ghost come on in one time you know god can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick even eli heard it he said oh by this time next year you're going to have a little boy so all of a sudden the next year next time she was at the house of god it wasn't going to be curse cursing her She was going to come with little Samuel. She was going to bring him after he's weaned and bring him to the house of the Lord. And she was going to walk in with that little boy. And by the way, Hannah did something with Samuel unlike any person in the Bible. She relinquished all of her rights and all of her fingerprints off of that boy and dedicated him wholly unto God in a very rare way. She said, I relinquish all my rights on this child. When I have him, I give him wholly and completely and utterly unto you. I'm not going to raise him. I'm going to wean him until he's, whatever, three, four. Then you have him his whole life. And did you know that man walked with God and finished well and served God with his whole heart and his whole life? What an example. I'm I'm encouraging all my Samuels, young and old alike today. The Lord is going to use you to rebuild people's burnt stones into the wall. Do it with grace. Do it without judgment. Do it with a pure heart. And all of a sudden, you are going to be this master craftsman. It's just going to be like a, a work of art. When you get done placing. It's like an artistic act. You're putting all these burnt stones back into the wall and it's going to be so majestic when it's done. It's just all those broken pieces are going to reflect the light of God in such a beautiful way. The fountains of the great deep are, have broken up. Genesis 7, 11. There's a rustling in the mulberry trees. There is a new heaviness of God's presence. Notice it in your prayer time, your devotional time, your study time. Put your antennas up. Be sensitive to God. Get alone by yourself. Get quiet. Turn off social media. Turn off the the idiot box. Get quiet. Because now it's not enough to hear his voice. We have to hear the heartbeat of the God-man in the manger. That's how sensitive we have to be right now. We have to hear a whisper whisper. Not lightning, not thunder, not earthquakes, a whisper. Father, I thank you so much for your precious child today, your glorious daughter, your glorious son, Lord, that from the top of his head, top of her head to the soles of his feet and her feet, that they will be washed and feel the weight of your oil, your warm oil, Lord, Your healing presence would fill the atmosphere around their minds and their bodies, Lord. Wall-to-wall Holy Ghost, top of the head, the soul, double dose of the Holy Ghost from coast to coast on them, Lord. We pray now, Lord, that you would heal the um, final wounds of those that have been hurt in your house, Lord, that you will heal all the wounds by Eli, Hophni, Phinehas, and everybody in between, and 
pastors and youth leaders and everything else that we've worn as a badge, we have to remove those badges. They're no longer signs of, of victimhood, Lord. We are, we, are, we are healed of the need to wear the mantle of being hurt by the people of God. We gladly uh, remove all of those signs of wounding that we've drawn attention to, the sackcloth and the ashes that you're calling us to give up and renounce like David did. When his son died, he got up, he washed himself, he ate, and he comforted his wife, Lord, and, and, and gave birth to Solomon. We pray, Lord, that anyone wearing the sackcloth and ashes of extended grief over their victim mentality will repent of that and cast it off now in the name of Jesus. Someone say amen. Can you put your hands together and give the Lord some praise? Amen. Come on up, Joaquin. We love you, and we would just like to say, uh, oh my, it's such a privilege and, uh, to have this opportunity. We are, we are so cozy today. We're in our little holy of holies today, and it's just sort of cozy. But it's a privilege to have you looking in. And wherever you are, beloved, the waters are troubled. Things are changing. You're in a new season. It's like when you drive to Nevada and you're no longer in California, but you're in Nevada, but the sand looks the same and the scenery looks the same, but you're in a different state with different rules, different consequences, and you better know what they are. You can pass from one state to another and not realize it yet. We've already passed into a new season, and it's glorious. Praise the Lord. If we bless you, you bless us. If we feed you, you feed the work of God here so we can meet our obligations here. Could you pray about that? Amen. We don't seek you out. We won't put you on a mailing list. We won't send Mike with a black jack to your house to threaten you. Well, some of you, the platinum givers, will do that to you. We don't do that. We don't send you requests. But if you love what you get here, pray about blessing us. Here's a dear brother I've known and loved for most of my life, Joaquin Monlevon. Come on in, brother. Hold that up. Jesus was uh, rejected in his day by the people of his day because he subverted expectation. And you follow Jesus. So are you greater than your master? No. So then, therefore, you too have been rejected. Um, and typically, the things that God asks his people to do are things that may not be understood by the people whom they are meant to for and so you probably felt all your life like Noah you know building something that nobody understands doing something that makes no sense um, basically uh, serving God as an insane man in the eyes of this world because you are insane until that which you have been called to do your purpose is uh, put on this earth not until then does it make sense so up until the flood comes, you are the insane man, which makes no sense to people around you and this world. But um, God, as Craig said today, God is about to pick up the stone which is your, which is your life, and he's going to place it in context so it can be understood, read, touched, and um, fulfill its ultimate purpose. Because if God gave you that vision, if God gave you that word, is he a man that he should lie? No, so unless you heard wrong, he will make it come to pass. Noah eventually was proven sane. And so shall you be in whatever weird little thing God has asked you to do. <laughs> So, Lord, thank you that we're not insane. I, w my prayer is that you reveal to this world uh, our lack of insanity. You c bring the flood 
bring whatever needs to bring so that each and every one of us here will have a sense and place us in context that we may be understood. We, we're, we're cool, right? We're, we, don't, we don't need it. But see, God's going to do that. See, we serve God either way, whether it makes sense or not. But, but how much more fulfilling is it when we know why we're here and it makes sense to who we're supposed to be talking to? So, Lord, thank you that you don't call us to be insane our whole lives and that you are bringing context in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said more in a minute. More in a minute. Vicki, come up here and pray or share whatever's on your heart. Thank you, Joaquin. Always a timely word. He is just always a bookend to call up. You're always going to hear something fresh. Oh, my, my. Yes, Holy Spirit. I just uh, I want to thank you for Joaquin, what he said, and, and for Pastor, of course, and his great words but I'm mostly for this uh, beautiful people here. And I want to just say, I love our authentic self. I just kept on thinking when Joaquin was um, speaking the word authentic and that God wants us just to be ourselves and nobody else. And I say, Holy Spirit, thank you so much for this room and for all the people uh, that we love and the people that are struggling and the people that are burnt stones. And I just ask you that you would give us insight every single day, every single minute, uh, that we would have that time to be quiet. I spend a lot of time um, being quiet with my cats. And I just say that uh, the Holy Spirit isn't speaking to me. And uh, all I'm, he's saying is just be you. Be your authentic self. Be who you are. Um, Holy Spirit, just reign into every individual in this room right now. And give us a supernatural power to um, use our two ears and be silent with our one mouth. And uh, I thank you for Craig and his anointing that is getting stronger. I feel the presence of the Lord in this room right now. And I just thank you for his um, uh, ability to submit unto God in, in every circumstances. Uh, just uh, give him a um, great amount of uh, courage and strength and rest uh, for the upcoming season. Bless this house and all the people who serve here in Jesus' mighty name. Praise the Lord. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. And God bless all of you, our, my warners. God bless you. I love you all. Thank you so much for taking the time. And you know what? We're here for you. If you have any prayer requests, you can send them to us. If you have any questions, you can always do that too. Because I am, in a way, a Bible answer man. I knew the original Bible answer man, Walter Martin. <laughs> we love you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift his countenance unto you and give you peace. God bless you. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.